We begin, though, this morning with that dramatic testimony on Capitol Hill. One aide, a then 24-year-old woman, giving her description of life inside the White House before, during, and after the January 6th insurrection. At the center of the explosive hearing was Cassidy Hutchinson, a former aide to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. She shared conversations that she says she had with people inside Trump's inner circle. People like Rudy Giuliani, White House counsel Pat Cipollone, and White House senior advisor Eric Hirschman. She also spoke about what she said were efforts from within the West Wing to rein the then president in, testifying that Trump sought to join his supporters marching to the Capitol, even after being told that some were heavily armed. We have team coverage this morning, but we begin with a look at some of the major moments from day six. I had an interesting conversation with Rudy. Mark, it sounds like we're going to go to the Capitol. He didn't look up from his phone and said something to the effect of, there's a lot going on, Cass. But I don't know, things might get real, real bad on January 6th. There were many discussions the morning of the 6th about the rhetoric of the speech that day. In my conversations with Mr. Hirschman, he had relayed that we would be foolish to include language that had been included at the president's request, which had lines along to the effect of fight for Trump, we're going to march to the Capitol, I'll be there with you, fight for me, fight for what we're doing, fight for the movement. I recall Tony and I having a conversation with Mark probably around 10 a.m., 10, 15 a.m., where I remember Tony mentioning knives, guns in the form of pistols and rifles, um, bear spray, body armor, spears, and flagpoles. I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Angle. And Mr. when Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. We're going to dig into all of it this morning with NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos, Politico reporter Daniel Lippman, and NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa. Ali, let's start with you. So this hearing was a bit of a surprise, announced only 24 hours before, and unlike previous hearings, the witness was not announced early. Now we know why. Her testimony included a lot of detailed information and some pretty serious allegations. What were the biggest revelations? Good morning, guys. Yeah, definitely some serious jaw-dropping jaw revelations. As a matter of fact, you could see Capitol Police officers, some Capitol Hill staffers watching this on their phones with the volume all the way up as this hearing was going on. People really captivated by this testimony. Uh, and really the revelations that came out of it mostly were just about how the former president and his inner circle were aware of these threats of violence that were going to go on on January 6th, and yet they pushed forward with the plans for that rally on the ellipse anyway, really going deeper into what they knew and when they knew it. Um, Hutchinson talking about how she had heard mentions of the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, these far-right groups, uh, days before the event on January 6th. You played at the top there. Uh, she talked about weapons that uh, Trump's inner circle knew would be at that rally, guns, bear spray, body armor, uh, and yet nothing was done to, to prevent that from happening. She even testified uh, that Trump wanted wanted those people to be allowed through the mags, through security, uh, to fill in empty gaps in the crowd to make it look fuller. Uh, she also talked about um, how he was uh, furious that he couldn't go along with this crowd. You remember at that rally, he said that he wanted to march with his supporters, and uh, Secret Service did not let him do that. She recalled this moment inside uh, the beast, that presidential vehicle uh, that we'll talk about a little later. Uh, and and just going through really the the things that she knew and was aware of from Secret Service from members of Trump's inner circle at that time. 
You mentioned the beast. Let's pick it up from there. One of the more explosive claims she made was about an incident on January 6th. After President Trump spoke at the Ellipse, she says she was told about this alleged confrontation inside the presidential limo, the beast, between Trump and his own Secret Service agents. Walk us through what she claims happened and also the response to her testimony about that, because there is some pushback now. So we already knew from previous hearings that the former president wanted to go to the Capitol after that rally on the ellipse. And we know that the Secret Service told him it was just impossible to be able to protect him in that sort of environment. But she really shed some light on the pushback the former president gave when they told him he couldn't go. Take a listen to a part of her testimony yesterday. This is a call received by one of our witnesses. Quote, a person let me know you have your deposition tomorrow. He wants me to let you know he's thinking about you. He knows you're loyal and you're going to do the right thing when you go in for your deposition. I think most Americans know that attempting to influence witnesses to testify untruthfully presents very serious concerns. So that was a soundbite we were going to talk about uh, witness tampering by the the committee's top Republican. But to sum up what uh, Hutchinson's uh, soundbite was talking about from uh, the day of the rally on the ellipse, she said uh, that Trump went so far as to try to grab the steering wheel of the presidential beast and was then taken away from uh, that steering wheel from a Secret Service agent. He then used his other hand to lunge at the Secret Service agent to what Cassidy Hutchinson described as the clavicle area of the Secret Service agent. Uh, and so we're really getting some new light as to how far the former president went in trying to march with his supporters to the Capitol. Hutchinson even saying that there were talks that he wanted to go there and speak uh, inside the House chamber. That's something that is only done when you are uh, officially invited by, by lawmakers in the Capitol. So definitely so many, so many things we didn't know before, before her testimony yesterday, Joe. And what is the pushback that we're hearing from President Trump or some of the other people about that? So we're hearing from the former president who posted on his uh, social media platform yesterday saying, quote, her fake story that I tried to grab the steering wheel of the White House limousine in order to steer it to the Capitol building is sick and fraudulent, very much like the unselect committee itself wouldn't even have been possible to do such a ridiculous thing. And as a matter of fact, uh, going off of what the Secret Service is saying, she said that she heard this story from a Secret Service agent. Uh, Secret Service is actually telling NBC News that, quote, any and all personnel that the January 6th committee requests are available to testify under oath uh, responding to yesterday's new allegations. So what we're really taking a look at is whether that Secret Service agent that she described as telling her this story, whether we could possibly hear from them in possible hearings. And let's talk about that possible witness tampering. It was another major moment really at the end during Congressman Liz Cheney's closing remarks. Real quickly, tell us what was it that she hinted at when it comes to evidence of possible witness tampering? Yeah, the committee's top Republican really suggesting that witnesses that are being called to testify and have testified are facing pressure from members of Trump's inner circle. She said that the committee uh, has asked these people whether they've been contacted by members of Trump's inner circle and Trump supporters, and uh, they did. They said that they were and being coerced and possibly pressured. And so that uh, she did hint at, as well that that would be um, something that committee members would look into for future hearings that we expect to happen in the next two, roughly two weeks. Ali Rafa, a lot to lay out this morning. Thank you for helping us do it. We appreciate it. For more analysis on the hearing, let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos and political reporter Daniel Lipman. Good morning to both of you. Daniel, Danny, we'll keep this straight. Daniel, starting with you, thanks for joining us. What did this hearing add to what we already knew about the Capitol riot? There's been a lot of question. Will these hearings really bring about new information, really make people say, wow, I can't believe that happened? What did we find out here, and how does it change the situation for former President Trump? I think for any American who is watching those hearings, uh, those two hours yesterday afternoon, uh, they will probably be just shocked at, at, at a the inner circle testimony from someone uh, who was very close to the action, uh, was there throughout January 6th, uh, and described as a president who was out of control, uh, who was 
fighting against his own Secret Service agent who is supposed to protect him and throwing dishes against a wall uh, earlier uh, during the transition. And so you don't, this is kind of a, uh, a jaw dropping day and something that people will probably remember for decades to come. Mm. Danny Savalos, let's bring you in here. And I first want to play another stunning moment from yesterday's testimony. This one is Ms. Hutchinson describing a conversation between a White House lawyer and Mark Meadows. Let's listen. The riders have gotten to the Capitol, Mark. We need to go down and see the president now. And Mark looked up at him and said, he doesn't want to do anything, Pat. And Pat said something to the effect of, and very clearly <laughs> had said this to Mark, something to the effect of, Mark, something needs to be done or people are going to die and the blood's going to be on your effing hands. Danny, clearly an intense account there of what she says was happening, but I'm specifically wondering about how a detail like that could impact this other investigation, the Department of Justice's criminal investigation that's happening parallel to this committee. Based on what we heard, based on that account right there, is Mark Meadows in any legal jeopardy? First, I have to assume that the DOJ already knew everything that was heard mm -hmm. yesterday in that hearing. But assuming this is new evidence to them, of course, it's interesting because at this stage, every new fact goes to knowledge, knowledge of Mark Meadows, knowledge of Donald Trump. Now, it could be argued on the defense side that what is knowledge? Did they absolutely know what was going on at the Capitol? But uh, the government doesn't need to prove absolute knowledge of anything. Uh, just awareness and the ability to stop it and to take action. It's not a slam dunk, even after this explosive testimony, but certainly the DOJ is taking notice. Danny, also I want to ask you about Liz Cheney's comments that Joe was just talking about with Allie, this comments about witness tampering. What are the rules here when it comes to contacting, potentially influencing witnesses in a congressional probe, and potentially how serious is this if what she says is true? You have witness tampering and obstruction of an official proceeding just to start off. Uh, those are serious crimes. And the uh, cited or the quoted uh, message that we saw there from a person, whoever a person is, sounds reminiscent of something out of The Godfather or Goodfellas. I mean, real nice testimony you got. Be a real shame if it didn't go the way we like it. Uh, I mean, that is very intimidating sounding and really quite clumsy. And why would anybody put that in writing? It seems absolutely just galactically stupid. So uh, I think the committee and Liz Cheney made a very good point at the end. Once again, dropping napalm, just explosive new information just at the very end uh, of a hearing, leaving us all wondering what is next to come. Galactically. I like that word, Danny. We love when you break things down like that for us. Daniel, let me bring you back in here. Hutchinson testified that Meadows and Rudy Giuliani, along with several House Republicans, we've heard about this throughout these hearings, asked Trump for a, Trump for a blanket pardon for anything related to the Capitol insurrection. Now, for his part, Giuliani did deny that claim. But how does that fill in the picture of what was happening within Congress on January 6th around that vote to certify the 2020 election? Just, just what does it, what does it say about what people knew, how people were involved. What do you make of that? Well, usually people don't ask for a blanket pardon if they don't think they've done anything wrong. So, you know, why would that be necessary? And so uh, it really kind of colors our, our understanding of what happened during that period uh, and showed that these members of uh, Trump's outer circle and inner circle, that they were worried about potential criminal exposure and they knew that Trump uh, Trump's tenure was coming to an end, and they wanted to make sure uh, that they were not caught up in any criminal liability from uh, what was uh, arguably, in, in many ways, an illegal effort to subvert the election by having these fake electors and by trying to uh, do something that even Mike Pence and uh, many other lawyers said was just constitutionally illegal. Daniel Lippman and Danny Savalos, thanks for helping us recap the surprise hearing yesterday. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. President Biden is in Spain this morning, where he'll meet today with NATO leaders in high-stakes discussions about the alliance's future. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell is traveling with the president and joins us now from Madrid. Kelly, good morning to you. So before we get into NATO, I do want to ask you real quickly about the January 6th hearing. Did the president watch any of the testimony yesterday, or at the very least, do we know if he's been updated on those proceedings? 
Well, Joe, I checked in with senior officials, and because of the president's schedule and, and the busy meetings and obligations here, he was not able to see it in real time. We're six hours ahead of the U.S., but they assure me that he will be briefed on the essential points. His focus has been on the international work he's doing here. Yeah, so let's talk briefly about the president's agenda today at NATO. We know he arrived in Spain after taking part in the G7 summit. It's been a busy morning so far. What more can you tell us? Well, officials are calling this perhaps the most consequential NATO summit in the history of the organization. That's saying a lot because there has been a huge buildup about this meeting, and President Biden is right in the center of all of it. And that includes the U.S. pledging additional troops in Eastern Europe as a part of the defense and deterrence related to NATO because of what Russia has done in Ukraine, because of the war and the provocations and the outright aggression from Russia. This alliance wants to show greater strength, greater deterrence. So the U.S. is committing to have long-term deployments of troops in countries along the eastern flank. And that is something that has been increasing, and now the president is expanding that commitment. There is also the work of expanding the group itself to include Sweden and Finland. Some of the roadblocks to that have been smoothed over. That was happening last night. And so now uh, an alliance of 30 nations could soon be 32. For Further strengthening how the uh, organizations of NATO, which come together to try to have a world order where there is a respect for boundaries and a respect for international norms, uh, to strengthen that. And that's part of what's happening here. So there are big consequential meetings. And of course, because Ukraine is so much at the heart of it, officials are also hearing from President Zelensky by video uh, today. He did that at the G7 meeting with a smaller group of leaders earlier. And now, what we are understanding is the message from him is about that ongoing threat to other nations, not just Ukraine, but the fact that what Russia has done should be a warning to the other members of this alliance. Joe? Kelly, while we have you yesterday, we heard from Biden's Health and Human Services Secretary outlining what's next following the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. We have like 30 seconds here. What was the big takeaway? Well, certainly the federal government is saying it's going to use all of the powers it has to try to provide protection for women with things like making cer certain there's medical privacy, making certain that medications used for abortion can be made available and would have uh, authorization and be used through uh, medical programs and insurance, and looking for ways to further strengthen access to that kind of reproductive care where the federal government can have a say. Joe? Kelly O'Donnell, a lot to cover from Madrid, Spain. Thank you so much, Kelly. Now to the latest results this morning from another round of primary elections yesterday. NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray joins us now. Mark, good morning. Let's start in New York here with the race for governor. Incumbent Kathy Hochul won the Democratic primary. Now, she's looking for her first full term here in office, but what can you tell us about who she'll face off against this fall? And listen, there's that music we love, Mark. <laughs> I love it, too. <laughs> Happy after primary Tuesday, Savannah. And yes, uh, Lee Zeldin is going to be the Republican who's going to face off against incumbent Governor Kathy Hochul in the fall. Zeldin's a Republican congressman who's giving up his seat for to run in this uh, race. And while the political winds are at the Republican Party's back right now, New York's going to be a really difficult state for the Republicans to be able to have success. So it'll be interesting to watch this contest. But Hopeful goes into the general election against Zeldin as the uh, favorite. I want to ask you now about something sort of unusual we've been seeing this cycle. So Democratic groups spending big money in Republican primaries. And the idea here is that they're hoping to boost far right candidates and then set up a more favorable matchup in the general election when that far right candidate would presumably be up against a Democrat. That was the case in Colorado and the GOP Senate race to take on incumbent Michael Bennett. Walk us through this and also what the result was like there. Yeah, so uh, Democratic groups were airing ads saying that Ron Hankins, who is the really conservative candidate in this field, he's too conservative for Colorado to be able to boost him with conservative primary voters. Uh, but also Democrats were just saying that's just kind of what, 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 what we view Hankins. Well, turns out the more moderate candidate, Joe O'Day, ended up winning this Republican primary. And O'Day is going to end up facing incumbent Democratic Senator Michael Bennett. And again, Colorado is a Democratic-leaning state. State, uh, but this still is a race worth watching, particularly if the political environment gets worse for Democrats. 
Mark, before I let you go, I do want to talk Illinois, where we had two very different House Republican incumbents facing off in the 15th district. Lay that out for us. This was a member-on-member -member race because of redistricting in Illinois. And Mary Miller, the uh, very conservative candidate who ended up getting Donald Trump's endorsement, ended up beating the more moderate Republican Rodney Davis. Rodney Davis ended up supporting a bipartisan commission to investigate January 6th. Uh, and Miller ended up winning out. And it was one of the races in which we have seen where if Donald Trump does endorse a candidate in kind of an even Stephen contest, that could end up helping. And it's certainly ended up helping Miller last night in Illinois. All right, Mark Murray, we always appreciate you right after a primary morning and bringing us some of that music. Thank you so much. Good to see you. <laughs> Ghislaine Maxwell has been sentenced to 20 years in prison for her role in the sex trafficking scheme led by Jeffrey Epstein. Well, handing down the sentence, the judge said that the former British socialite had a, quote, instrumental role in the horrific sexual abuse of multiple young teenage girls. Maxwell was convicted on five charges of sex trafficking back in December after a three-week-long trial. Her legal team has since vowed to appeal the conviction. And now this morning, singer R. Kelly is set to be sentenced in a high-profile federal sex trafficking case. The R&B star was convicted of nine counts last year, including racketeering and sex trafficking charges after a five-week trial in Brooklyn. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen joins us now from outside the courthouse. Hi, Ron. Good to see you. So R. Kelly's conviction was seen as really a key moment in the Me Too movement. It had made a lot of headlines, documentaries about it. Now his sentencing, though, comes after decades of abuse allegations. Remind Remind us, though, what exactly he's being sentenced for and just how much time he could be facing. Well, it was a unique case because it was the first time that the majority of the victims are black women. And the question as this case proceeded was, would these women get justice in the Me Too movement as others have? Uh, they are. Um, so that's where we are now. Uh, the basic charge against him is racketeering. That R. Kelly was running a criminal enterprise that was about recruiting, abusing young women and girls for his own sexual gratification and sexual pleasure. That's what the charge is. Um, he faces up to life in prison, essentially. Um, the defense has been asking for a charge of less than 10 years in prison. Um, so essentially, we'll hear today from some of the, the victims in the case. Uh, it's unclear whether we'll hear from R. Kelly or not, um, but he basically faces uh, life in prison and is likely to spend the rest of his life in jail. Now, Kelly's also facing another federal trial in Chicago, Ron, that's on child pornography and obstruction charges. When's that trial set to happen? And then right. looking forward, what happens to R. Kelly once he is sentenced in that trial and any impact there then on what's happening in Chicago? I think the short answer is that he's basically going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Uh, there are these cases pending in Illinois and in Minneapolis, uh, state sex crimes charges. Um, this sentencing will happen. Uh, it is unlikely that he will ever see freedom again. Um, it's unclear exactly when the trials will happen, probably before the end of the year. Um, but again, the bottom line is that he has all this, these legal issues piling up, piling up, piling up. And uh, it's, it's very unlikely that he is ever going to be released from prison. Uh, these are allegations, these are cases that go back to the 1990s. Federal prosecutors have been after R. Kelly for decades and decades, and they finally, finally got him, essentially, um, last year when he was convicted on these nine counts that included racketeering. Um, and today he's going to face the music, as it were. All right, Ron Allen, we know you'll keep an eye on that as he's sentenced this morning. Thank you so much. Time to get a check on your morning news now, weather. Which means Michelle Grossman in her Wednesday pink joins us in studio. Hello. Yeah, the dress doesn't have quite the room it did pre-pandemic, but it's pink nonetheless. It's adorable. I work. <laughs> Thanks. Good to see you guys. We are watching showers and storms once, in, once again in the south. We have a frontal boundary that's kind of draped there. It's parked there, and it has been for the past few days, and it will be for the next few days. So we're looking at on and off showers. We're looking at heavy downpours. We're looking at the risk for flash flooding. So this is a setup for day today. There's that frontal boundary with slow-moving storms and showers and we're looking at heavy rain in some spots localized flooding as well and then look what happens tomorrow we're going to see an area of low pressure in the gulf it could be our next depression it's going to be a quick one if we do see it but nonetheless it's going to bring some uh, showers to the eastern parts of texas 
good news in the long run because they're in extreme drought, but we could see the chance for some flash flooding as we're going to see up to four inches of rain in some spots. So this is the rainfall forecast through Friday. You can see pockets of heavy rain where you see these darker colors. The yellows, the reds, the oranges is where we're seeing those heavier rains, especially along eastern Texas. Houston, you could see quite a bit of rain. So you're going to need the umbrella as you head out the next couple of days, especially where you see these red colors right along the coast is where we're going to see the most rain. And that's going to be until Friday at least. Here is that area of low pressure I was talking about, 40% chance of formation to become a tropical depression. It's going to move off to the north and then eventually move northward uh, by Friday. But still in the next couple of days, we're going to see quite a bit of rain. Also looking at expanding heat once again, we had a little break in the northern and central plains, but temperatures once again into the 90s, 98 degrees in Rapid City today. That's 15 degrees above average, 90 in Minneapolis. I think of Joe every single time now. 94 in <laughs> Omaha, 84 in Chicago, and that heat expands to the east into the 90s in Philadelphia, five degrees above average for this time of year. Same story in Richmond. So we're tracking the tropics. I showed you that uh, area, of, uh, not quite an area of depression, but a cluster of showers and storms in the Gulf. We're also looking at a system that is uh, impacting the Windward Islands uh, as we speak. And we're looking at winds at 40 miles per hour. Tropical storm winds, 39 miles per hour, uh, is what you need for a tropical storm. But we still don't have that low closed in the middle. So we're going to continue to watch that. It has winds at 30 miles per hour. It's moving Moving to the west, so we're looking at uh, impacting the Windward Islands, eventually into Aruba, and eventually into the Central Plains, uh, Central, uh, sorry, Central America. We're looking by the weekend. That's a big difference. That'd be something. <laughs> Can we clarify that? Yeah, Central Nebraska. America. Yeah, it's gonna go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You oh, made yeah. me laugh. That's fine. I, I know what you're talking about. I know. Tropical cyclone too. Right. I just side name. Side name. PTC2. We're, we're watching PTC two. Yeah. All right. You'll keep us posted on that. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.